coming from Belgium and my parents, I was born in Morocco, my parents coming from Morocco. I will give um, a short presentation about research I'm doing now in Flanders and I will try to make bridges uh, with the things I have heard this morning. I will say something about the context, the use methodology, the analysis, and uh, this, this, this is important because I want to make the bridges with uh, the things I have heard this morning. Um, the meaning of the results and maybe how we can uh, renew our education in Flanders. Um, and um, I think that the HIPAA model I will say um, in a few minutes, but it is what, what the model is and what uh, the components and why I think this model is important for us to maybe something I don't know if you know the Belgian uh, context is a little bit complicated. Um, as I said, it's important to know that um, religious education is in the constitution, but in a practical matter, uh, as we know, it's much more um, complicated. We have uh, two big uh, denomination schools, let's say the Catholic schools, and then we have, we have the public schools where everyone normally can go on, and then we have some Jewish schools and so on. But this, this, the, the, Three percent of the school, so it's important to know why we did, uh, why this research is in Flanders and not in Brussels and not in Malone, but it will hopefully be become, become clear um, during the presentation. Um, the research um, that we are doing in uh, Brussels and Leuven at the Catholic University of Leuven is about ideals. Why? Um, because it has never been done. We have less or more the same situation as France. Um, everything that has to do with religion is private, and everything outside is, is just uh, have to be like of house university, separate. Okay. Um, so that's that's really important to, to know. Um, we try to to interview um, parents, Muslim, Flemish speaking parents, and. Muslim, um, speaking youngsters, um, to see what do, are, what do they think, and when we know that, what the, uh, the ideas of those uh, people are, then we can think about models to uh, make them critical persons and think critical about their religion. That's important. Um, it's inspired, in fact, um, from the, the psychology. Um, maybe I didn't mention it, I'm a jurist, so I'm a lawyer. <laughs> But also a pedagogue, so I, I'm, I'm uh, working at the cross of those two uh, domains. So it's based on um, studies that uh, has been done with colleagues in the UK, in Germany, and in Holland. We are doing a parallel uh, study with uh, our Dutch speaking, uh, the Dutch, uh, the Holland. Okay, These are, those are the two main questions that we ask. Really simple. How do you want your child to be when he's adult? And in fact, we know which frame we are starting um, from because we want to know which uh, religious um, ideals parents give to their youngsters and what is the vision of those, those youngsters. Is there a difference? Okay. Um, why is it important? In Belgium, we have just uh, commemorated the 40 years of migrations. We are just a really new group of migrations, majority in Belgium. So it's important to know what's the vision that those parents and those youngsters have, uh, much more in the frame of religion, religious education in schools. That's technical how we do the, the coding and it's based on literature, but we really, it's really open because it's the first time that such a research has been done in, in Flanders, in Belgium. Um, it's just an explorative uh, study. So we, um, we look at the sociological, sociological um, literature, but um, because it's from a psychological and pedagogical approach, we just uh, analyze that uh, in an open way. No, the first um, finding, because the research is not closed yet, we will have our symposium in January 2016, is um, that we see that the concepts 
the content of the concept used by the parents are not the same of those used by the Western European um, frameworks. It's really important because if you are talking about respect, critical thinking, what is it? Uh, because we are in, in Belgium, um, there is an idea that Muslims are not thinking free and so on, and you have to to, to uh, free yourself with a headscarf and so on. So there are really important questions. So those concepts, um, the content is not the same. So if you are, we are talking with each other, we are not talking the same language. That's uh, one of the findings. Um, as you see, it, it, it's not a, always a matter, matter of different concepts uh, in an extreme way, but in the level of. So if we ask parents how do you be, how you want your child, uh, what, what is important, and they say autonomous, I uh, want to he, uh, he's free or uh, make his choice by himself and so on. Um, they, are, they do agree, but what is it make your choice by himself? Because we have the Quran and it's not free, and what does it mean? So you see, it's the same, but what is it, where is the difference? It's difficult to know exactly um, where the difference is. So um, we concluded that uh, I think every Muslim will, will agree, of almost every Muslim will agree, that being Muslim is a way of life. At the one hand, it's easy. But on the other hand, it's not easy because if we translate this uh, fact or this observation in schools, then we have a problem because public schools will tell you, okay, but we are not a Muslim school and how we are going to manage and what is the information that we are going to have to give in the, in the courses of religious education. I'm only speaking about the education of uh, religion in public schools. Um, as I said, or, uh, it's important for um, to have insights uh, of um, those concepts that young and parents have. Why is it important? Because we are trying to translate um, those findings in an educational model. So, um, because of the just a historical fact, um, there's not really clear vision about what do we have to teach our children and I do not agree about the content, I think we have to um, educate our children in attitudes and not really knowledge, I mean, of course you need knowledge and skills, but I think it's much more important to make and have attitudes that make them think by themselves, search information, be critical, what's wrong, what's, what's good for me or what's not good for me, so I think it's important to, okay, how are we going to translate it? for education, and then, uh, the colleague, I think, uh, said this morning this question from how can we translate in didactic forms? And we have some ideas like discussions, uh, discussion groups, be critical, so the Socratic way of asking, um, uh, making materials that can be used and trigger the uh, young students. So uh, that are some of the arguments um, to um, give another approach for education. Okay. Um, I will close so far will, uh, this last slide. Um, Rosnani uh, Hashim is uh, a professor in uh, Malaysia. She uh, she's I think ten years now, fifteen years working on a model. Uh, uh, as you know, there is much of reform uh, in also in Asia, um, and she developed a model that is based on philosophy with children. I don't know if you are uh, familiar with with the, con the concept. Um, it is uh, an European or West, uh, uh, West European concept, but she translated, I will be short, so I will not be uh, really technical, but she's, um, she's convinced that you can also philosophy, do philosophy of theorizing um, with Muslim children, with Quranic material, with Hadith material, just with materials that in fact are um, in history, not always looked as we can be critical on the Quran. So, um, in the beginning, her model uh, was named Philosophy for Children, and she had uh, much critics. And you, you can feel the, um, I say it in English, you can feel that there is a discussion that philosophy, Muslims link that with uh, Christian or a Greek or um, uh, non religious framework, but in fact, it that's not true. You can think and you can ask questions and you can uh, be critical with the material that the Quran had in uh, historical um, 
materials. So um, that's why afterwards she named it Hekma model. It was also one of the questions I had is Hekma, what is uh, wisdom and how can we interpret it? But for her, it's, it's okay, how can I make Yomsus in her uh, case um, to more wisdom, right? to, to make them uh, knowledge, to give them skills, and then to make competent, give an attitude, then to put wisdom after the sandals and, and react um, in that way. So, um, as I mentioned, by questioning, by um, discussion in groups, by reading, uh, and so on. And her new element, as I mentioned, was she really introduced Quran text and Hadith, and it was really uh, revolutionary, a revolution um, in, in that way of thinking. So, we are trying to, to translate what we our findings in the research to an Islamic new model with this element to reform the religious education in public schools because in Catholic schools we, we don't have access but in the public schools and it's it's quite um, quite um, revolutionary to, to do that in our public schools. Um, so I think Thank you. on behalf of my colleagues um, um, through Richard and Jane. Um, the topic was that we were given to present upon is really interesting because um, we were trying with my colleagues to find a way to frame our project to fit that um, topic and I think and I hope we were successful in this regard. Basically what I'm going to do today in the few minutes that we have to uh, I have to present the project is to give you an overview of the sort of thing that we're doing uh, in Durham. Um, I'm involved in a national UK project that looks into the possibilities and complexities of doing research, any research, in more than one language, any language. So, in terms of establishing the focus in relation to the title that we were given, when it comes to education, we talk about the UK, a UK-based international educational project. In terms of the means, because the title is questioning education as a way of questioning the means um, in light of the objectives, our means is the use of language, and the objective is human well-being. So the project is really asking this question. Is language as a means helping us achieve human well-being as a goal in situations of human vulnerability, pressure, and pain? Uh, this is particularly because of the research that talks about that intense pain is world-destroying, and also that intense pain is also language-destroying, as the content of one's world uh, disintegrates so that which would express and uh, project the self is robbed of, uh, of its source and its subject. Word, self, and voice are lost or nearly lost. So basically we're looking into what happens to language when a person um, is in a vulnerable situation. I'm going to explain this a bit better now. The project is called Researching Multilingually at the Borders of Language, the Law, Law and the State. It runs, uh, it's a three-year project funded by the AHRC Council, which, a council which is the Arts and Humanities Research Council, a national council in the UK. And it looks specifically at this idea about what happens to a human being in cases of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. The project has two overarching aims. 
The first is to research interpreting <coughs> translation and multilingual practices in challenging contexts. For example, in asylum seeking, uh, in healthcare, uh, in people who are prisoners, and so on. While doing so, to evaluate appropriate research methods, traditional and arts-based, and develop theoretical approaches for this type of exploration. So basically, researchers in the area of uh, human rights, in the area of linguistics, in the area of language education, and other areas have come to the conclusion that we don't have um, methodologies appropriate for handling research that is done across languages. So, because concepts of borders, security, insecurity, pain, and pressure raise important practical and ethical questions as how research might be conducted. So what's our research context? We try here, um, because this is a research methodology project, um, we try to focus on methods. And part of the innovative nature of the project lies not in using new methods per se, but rather in comparing across discipline specific methods. Um, interrogating arts and humanities methods where the body and the body politics are under threat. And in developing theoretical and methodologic, methodological insights as a result and in focusing on arts-based representations. And I'm going to come to this arts-based representation points later. And there are some pockets of work in disciplines, but no overarching framework across multiple disciplines. And here I'd like to, work, to refer to the work that was, has been done at Birmingham University on multilingualism, where people, researchers at Birmingham University, have gone into the different um, multilingual areas within Birmingham specifically, but also they're also doing other work now, for example, in, in Cardiff and Leeds. And they were trying to explore how different languages operate in specific contexts. But this is different from what we're trying to do, where we're trying to see how language operates in situations of pressure and pain. Um, so the objective of the course is, of the project is quite intentional, creative and resourceful. We have an overarching construct for thinking about the possibilities and uh, for and complexities of researching multilingually. So we were, when we were trying to theorize that and to see how can we help researchers who are working across languages, not just in, in the areas of pressure and pain, but for example, yourselves. I assume that many of you are doing research in more than one language in different areas, um, in the oil industry or in religious studies or in the education. Um, how can we help you as members of this project? I don't, I don't uh, understand better the possibilities and complexities of doing research in more than one language. So our overarching um, construct is developing researcher intentionality. And by that we mean the lifelong process of becoming more aware when making researcher decisions as appropriate for particular studies and contexts. Increasing purposeful as uh, increase, uh, so that researchers become increasingly purposeful mm -hmm. as researchers rather than simply following fashion or convention. In the School of Education at Manchester University, there is a study, and there has been a study about intentionality as a term, where it has been discovered that many researchers and educationalists, they follow certain methodologies either because it is a fashion, so, you know, that's the thing now, or because it's conventional, so that's what people have been doing all the time, and that's why, for example, that's why we train our PhD students to do it that way so that they can pass the Bibles. But our project is saying, no, we want researchers to become more intentional and to become more purposeful. So, with the concept of intentionality, we, we're trying to help researchers trigger, to realize, trigger, or to trigger realization, which means that we want researchers to try to understand the, just to understand that there could be possibilities and complexities for doing research in more than one language. This is particularly important because many researchers, they take it for granted. They say, oh, I'm a, a multilingual researcher, but this is a, a Spanish context or a, a French context or an English context, and therefore, I'll just do it in one language. No, try, try to draw on your multiple resources and also reflect and to develop some kind of awareness of those possibilities and complexities, but also 
to have that awareness inform your thinking and your practice. Okay, now, the structure of the project is five case studies, two hubs, and four PhD students. Um, the five case studies are all case studies where research is conducted multilingually. The two hubs are a plain research methodology hub and a creative arts hub. So our first case study is a global mental health. It looks into translating sexual and gender-based trauma. And it's based in Scotland, but the research is done in Sierra Leone, which has now moved to Uganda because of Ebola. Um, Ross White is the clinical psychologist, and he has discovered that some of the terminologies that he has taken from the Western tradition to Africa doesn't really apply. Mm -hmm. And he's really questioning how to integrate, even to learn from the African communities to incorporate into his own research. The second case study is a law case study, and it's based in um, Glasgow, Scotland, and it looks into translating vulnerability and silence in legal processes. That is that, particularly in the UK, sometimes silence, when you are in an asylum interview, sometimes silence is interpreted as that you are lying or that you are trying to make up new information, particularly for those trying to get to have asylum um, <coughs> rights. But Sarah and Karen, who are colleagues on this project, are saying, no, silences could be cultural, silences could be so many other things uh, other than what's commonly known. The third case study is working and researching multilingually at state and EU borders. That is, that is the borders on Romanian and Bulgarian borders. We have colleagues there who are working. Of course, they have a busy time there because of all the um, Syrian refugees that are coming from Turkey. So there is a lot there about how do border guards deal with these people and if there, are there any kind of human rights violations that are happen, happening because of languages. The fourth case study is multilingual ecologies in American Southwest borders, particularly Arizona in the United States, and it's also because of approximating borders. The fifth case study is the Islamic University of Gaza, which is a partner of our project. They are de now developing a program on teaching Arabic as a foreign language, as a way of combating the siege, and a way of reaching out to the international community, a way of presenting a totally new picture of Gaza. Our project is helping uh, Dr. Nazmi al-Masri in Gaza to have um, to develop their teachers, but also to develop an intercultural program that is based in Gaza to the entire world. So those are basically five case studies. And those five, five case studies are independently conducting research that involves more than one language. And they also deal with different situations where the human being is under threat and in pain. So we use multimodal complementary methods. And I, I, as today when we were listening, when I was listening to um, the different presentations that were said today, I, I wish that we could have more of that into our discussions of more Islamic discourses. The first is the research in multilingually translating cultures hub, and that's the hub where I belong. I work within this group. We have, we have this rigorous academic investigative comparative methods. So we travel a lot, we accompany those researchers in, in Bulgaria and Romania, in Arizona, in Glasgow, and we attend those he law hearings and we collect data. But we also have the Creative Arts Hub. And traditionally within the UK, um, creative arts have been used to express research findings. But Alison Phipps, who is the manager, the principal, of, uh, the principal investigator of our project, decided that no, she wants creative arts to be right there from the beginning as a way of collecting data, as a way of um, um, research analysis, literature review, and so on. And just so one minute of her presentation of why we have creative arts if the internet works. as teachers, are working in universities, 
And it's really challenging the idea that there is such a thing as monolingualism. And what we've done, which I think is important within this project, is engage a group of artists to work alongside us, to help us with our work of interpretation. And what I find an interesting question is, what happens when, if you like, the arts as forms of language meet the languages of academia? We decided rather than putting artists at the end of the project to create something for us that allowed us to just do our research and they could do their art, what I wanted to do was actually incorporate that all the way along so we could learn from each other through a flow of conversation between the language spoken by researchers and the language spoken by artists and the multilingual languages and environments that we were working in in our case studies. So that's meant as employing artists as researchers through the project and looking at the arts as, if you like, a, a, another language for expressing research. Already we're really seeing some interesting things emerging out of listening to artists and artists listening to linguists. So we have... Okay, so it has actually um, transformed my whole understanding of research methodology and now I like, I'm very happy to make an argument for the incorporation of creative arts as a form of research methodology. Um, we have a project website. Um, within that website, we have a research network and that I would like you all to be part of. Um, <laughs> and basically, we ask researchers who do research more than one language in whatever context, in whatever combination of languages to present their reflections. Um, all what you need to do is just to answer two questions because we use those reflections as data. Uh, what is your experience of doing research in more than one language? And what is your experience of becoming aware of the complexities in this area? We already have 44 profiles, um, but um, still we don't have any people from Islamic studies. And um, we'd like to have people from different disciplines. Um, 300 to 500 words, and you send that to me, please. But we also have two publications that have come out of the project and more on the way. And we have a newsletter that comes out regularly. Uh, Lauren Roberts um, at the University of Glasgow is managing this. So if you'd like to become a member of our newsletter, please email Lauren. She'll be very happy to add your email. And I think that's it for now. I'm going to say <laughs> thank you multilingually in the languages I speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have questions about these two presentations? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the mic is somewhere. <coughs> that works, it works. Okay, uh, just regarding the first presentation. Uh, the project you talked about, uh, was it aimed specifically for Muslim students in public and Belgian schools? Or did you want to uh, bring a broader understanding of Islam even for non-Muslim students? Okay, no, the pros, um, in fact, we start because the, the study is also being done in the UK and Germany and Dutch and, and Holland. Um, and my professor was invited two year, three years ago. And uh, in fact, it started just we want to interview Muslims because no one did it in Belgium. So that was the first aim. But afterwards, we were thinking because we are working at the uh, Institute of Higher the High Institute of Family Sciences, and there we are thinking from what can we do with this data, what can we do with these results, and we have two aims. Trying to translate it for education, that's my field. My, promo my promoter is working in the social sector with uh, family science, in the family sciences. So it's, it was not the first aim, we just want to know what ideals do parents give to their children, and then translate it in family sciences or in education. 
because we have colleagues doing that with Catholics, with Protestants, but no, not with Muslims. And we also choose that um, the fact that they are Flemish-speaking Muslims is really important because we have also French-speaking or Arabic-speaking or Berber-speaking, but that's not um, the target. Thank you very much for this presentation. I feel home. Finally, education. <laughs> That's why I belong. Uh, my my question is to you, and I have some maybe comments only. It's about uh, the subject. We uh, I don't know if you know that normally when we talk about education, we talk about three functions: what we call qualification, socialization, and subjectification. Uh, we teach in order to qualify children, we socialize them in a certain order, and we teach them to be critical thinkers in what we call subjectification. These are the three functions of education. But mostly these three functions, the second, I, I'm not going to talk about the first one, about the, uh, but the, the, this, the, this, the last two, socialization and subjectification, are very important for your subject. Because what's happening is the fact that we try to socialize students to a certain order, and we try to teach them critical thinking. What they do, they criticize the social order that we try to socialize them in. And this happens very much for the Muslims, because they criticize the Muslim, the, the social order that the Western schools try to socialize them in. And what happens is that they become more like a, a break in the laws, because they don't follow the social order that the school is trying to socialize them in. But in, the fa in fact, the school is trying to teach them to be democrats and critical thinkers. And this is where we often have in education the problem, is between socialization and subjectification. We try to socialize them in a certain order and try to give them uh, 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 tools to be critical thinkers. And, and my question is, uh, is this something that you notice it in your uh, research um, and for you, as I'm a multilingual researcher, and I think I've been uh, cooperating with Angela Chris from Birmingham about multilingualism. I was included in that project about coupling the schools, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and she was at my university as well. And we had, uh, I had a lot to maybe give, even my PhD. Uh, I wrote I would, I would have a methodology about uh, being a multilingual researcher and uh, uh, being uh, maybe in two different worlds, in the parents' worlds and the, and the other worlds. Speaking Arabic, I make, make all my interviews in Arabic and then try to, to translate them, and to translate the analysis into English. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much for these two presentations. Okay, I just, because I can, can go in detail, but um, as I told, we started with the social uh, socialization goals, because we have to start with a certain frame, um, that's one. And the critical uh, attitude. Um, we observed, really clearly, that youngsters between 17 and 25 um, every time grasp to their room. That's what the bridge with the first uh, course this morning, and more specifically in Brussels. I don't know if you know Flanders, but we have Brussels as a cap capital, we have a high percentage of migration with a Muslim background. We have Antwerp also, and then you have the rest. So we can observe with the, the little group that we have, 40 interviews, that um, they, um, they grasp the rule, just in the fact, the orthopraxy, to uh, be radical or to, um, do, have, to have a rebel uh, attitude. But that's not the critical thinking. So it, it's in their mind we have to learn them that um, you can ask questions about the social system, but it's not the attitude. And we just observed that in, uh, in Brussels and in Antwerp, that the motivation is not the right motivation, because their knowledge is not enough to be critical like we understand being critical. I don't know if I've answered uh, your, your question. Uh, more or less we can have further discussions, because I want to leave the mic for others, because this is a good subject. Um, it's also in the responsibility, and that's um, yes. Good. Yes, my, my question is: is if you have noticed that there is a um, um, conflict between socialization and subjectification, and that's what's happening to Muslim students, especially newly arrived in Sweden, 
they are maybe. Uh, but they have, sh they have, most of them have shared Google, so that's a uh, we Sometimes we are laughing at that, but it's really diff mm -hmm. it's difficult, it's complex. Okay. Okay, other questions? Or remark? It seems only me who is interested in education here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> things were clear that there is no clear there are no questions you might have questions for the the two who went to sit uh, in the audience mm -hmm. escape from question Sandra has a question over there well, it's only because you're saying nobody's got any interest but, um, I come from Birmingham and we've had the whole issue of Muslims and education um, being seen through a very sinister light. I don't know if people here have heard of the Trojan horse and how Fox News then called Birmingham a no-go area for any Muslims. And so on the one hand, Muslim parents were being criticised for not being involved enough in all stereotypes that they're not that interested in, in the education of their kids. But when... Um, Muslim parents became the school governors and involved. They were seen as um, extremists. And there have been a real issue because on the one hand, we have a great multicultural model. And actually, there was a lot of work done in the syllabus in both the primary and secondary school looking at a lot of these issues. And there's quite a sophisticated and nuanced um, understanding already. But now with the political climate, all of that is being thrown out. So in some ways it's not new because through the 70s and 80s and 90s we had all of this going on in England and you know the, the issue of Muslims in Britain, the integration and education. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff there but it seems with the post 9-11 context a lot of that was now being pushed back so I just was interested in your thoughts on that. We don't have Sinobi. So I, I say it a little bit um, in a pessimistic. Um, I do recognize some things that you are saying, but I don't know if it's that worse in Belgium, in Brussels, or in Antwerp, because those are the big cities where we have also the highest level of youngsters going to Syria and so on. So politicians are really um, looking at us and, and seeing how can we. Uh, in schools, trying to to um, to make them less radical or at least critical thinking and knowing what's the the right information to to believe in and or not. Um, but we don't have syllabi. That's one of the problem. I, I don't know if you you can imagine that we don't have a model in Belgium and we have teachers coming from Egypt, Turkey, Morocco, whatever, and they don't speak even the language sometimes. So it's really a really real problem. So you see, um, so I, the second part I can really answer and also the parents because um, we have uh, only 40 years of migration history. The parents, my parents for example, don't know the language, the system, so it's my generation that with, with little steps um, come, be, uh, come to be involved in schools and, and, and raise their voice, but it's, it's really a hot situation now in, in Belgium and in Versus an Android for sure. The front. Yeah. Okay. So, just a question to the sister to avoid receiving questions myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you talked about this multi-linguistical uh, approach and the fact that it could be uh, a methodology even for us to, uh, to approach things, maybe even uh, revelation and reality, etc. I want you to, to develop more on this, first of all. Second of all, when you are talking about the language, it seems that you are referring also to culture and to other dimensions of language that are not only uh, spoken language, and this reminded me of a story of uh, the, the conquistadors when they arrived in, in South America and uh, they found the indigenous tribes 
and they were asking themselves if these indigenous tribes were human or animal. And so for them, the way to know it, I think it comes from Aristotle, is that the human is the laughing animal. So if they laugh, it means that they are animals. So they brought their bouffant. How do you say this? Yeah. The, the, their clown, you know this uh, buffoon? And, and they tried to make them laugh, and nobody laughed. So they were thinking, this was the confirmation that they were really animals. But then one of the leaders of this conquistador felt, he, tried, uh, he felt, and they started to laugh, all of them. So just to say that this is maybe an example of the cultural difference, and um, what do you mean by, by language? Is, is it more than uh, just the spoken language? What, what are the dimensions? Okay, thank you very much for very, two very interesting questions. Um, the first question, um, this project emerges, emerged from a need within particularly the UK university system, which is currently becoming more and more inter internationalized. So we're having uh, more and more PhD students who are doing research in all kinds of disciplines in various languages, but supervisors are not really sure how to handle those languages. And historically, supervisors have not been very much encouraging of using languages other than English. And, and they have been distracting students, for example, from using strange structures in their languages um, when they write a thesis, or they haven't been advising students to where to look when they search for complete their literature reviews and so on. So that was the initial start for this project. How can we help PhD students? How can we help um, supervisors? But we realized when we were trying to think about the entire framework of this project that there is a difference between researching multilingually and researching multilingualism. Researching multilingually is <coughs> the process of doing research in different languages. So our focus is about the process. What are the difficulties? What are the possibilities of doing research in more than one language? And the second project, the, um, the second term is researching multilingualism, which looks into cultures and societies and communities. It's like the, the one that Angela Priest and Adrian Blackledge are doing in Birmingham. But uh, we are not looking into multilingualism, though it's one of our fields. But we are looking into the methodological processes of doing research in more than one language. And I think it's important to, to everybody in here, if you speak more than one language, and if you're doing research in more than one language, that would be, it would be great to get your insights, because that would better our understanding of those possibilities and of those complexities. And it will only come from the researchers themselves. Um, we don't want to have those big, grand theories that are parachuted on top of people. No, we want it to come from the researchers, and that's why we have traveled everywhere. And we try to reach people of different contexts to say, if you're doing Islamic studies, tell us, what, what, what are the possibilities and complexities? For example, I was talking to a, uh, Sister Maha the, the other day, and she was telling me that one of the possibilities, one of the complexities that she's facing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's very difficult to handle um, um, the, um, theologi theological and Islamic legal translations or translations of the Quran, of text, Quranic text, because it's quite it's a big responsibility. So this is one of the, of the complexities, for example. Um, and that's why we talked about developing research intentionality. That is becoming more aware that this is a resource that we have. Researching in multiple languages historically have been seen as an obstacle. Oh, the student is doing her research in, in Farsi and English. This is a problem. But we're trying to say, no, it's not a problem, it's, a, it's enriching your research. It is challenging databases, for example, qualitative analysis databases, to have them incorporate Farsi. It's, it's the challenge supervisors to try to get res researchers to look into Farsi literature. It's a way of developing research. So I hope I, that's the first question. So I think nobody is an exception. We can draw from anybody in any field. And the two questions, the prompts that we have, um, okay, anyway, I'll get the slides on. Um, the two questions that we have posed were versus props, but people can also submit their profiles in different languages, and that's the whole point. You can submit your profile in Arabic, you can submit it in, in Hindi, you can submit it in any language. With respect
respect to your second question about languages, what do we mean by languages? I think this is, and, and the relationship between language and culture. This is a very important question, and it's actually a very subtle question, a very intelligent one, because we, said it's, we have reached the conclusion that it's very hard, no matter how much we try, to separate researching multilingually from researching multiculturally. And that um, language comes with its culture. And um, we talk, we, our definition of language is quite broad. For example, we use creative arts as language, as Alison explained in the, in the video. So we, we, we use drawings as language, uh, we use drumming as, the, as language, we use silence as language. So it's, it's very open to any kind of definition that the researchers themselves want to incorporate. And that's why I say it's back to you, the researchers. If you have, if you have possibilities, if you, if you have complexities, in any area that you're working on, and you'd like to bring this to the fore, our website is there, and it's 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 uh, frequently visited by different researchers because this is a two million pound project, like a heavily funded project. Um, that you could have your profile there. I manage the research network on our prof on our website, and we have had I have had people contact me to tell me I have, I'm a, a researcher, for example, in in. Uh, Poland, and I have seen so and so on your website. Can you please put me in touch? The other thing is that we have a book series coming up and an article, so we'd like to invite you to publish in those book series and articles. I think it's, it's about time to have Muslim scholars in, into those kind of research areas. Thank you. Yes, I think the last question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I have one question regarding the one specific question regarding this case study that has been done in Gaza regarding the Arab uh, language uh, as a foreign language for for uh, international. So I want to know how you are dealing with the with the university in Gaza. Is it distance learning? So what the tools are you using? Uh, can you please uh, elaborate a bit more? Um, yes, sure. Um, this is a, a very interesting question and it is a very challenging um, case study that we're working in, but it's extremely rewarding. We have learned a lot about how to deal with people under siege. Um, initially, when the project was conceptualized, the borders between Gaza and Egypt were open. And we had uh, the conception that we would go to Gaza uh, the whole team. We are 22 researchers on this um, project. Uh, but subsequently, the borders were closed. Um, most of our communication is online and via Skype meetings. Um, however, and the training recently, last month, they had a major training course that was designed in Glasgow and delivered a teacher education um, 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 program that was delivered to the teachers in Russia only via Skype. And the researchers in Glasgow were, were very impressed by the fact that they described themselves as being carried because the students carried their laptops and showed them the rooms in Gaza. And the researcher was involved and timed herself, so she woke up with the, you know, the times in Gaza, she, she paused for the prayers and so on. So our, our connection with Gaza is all online, but Nazmi al Masri, who is in charge of this case study, is developing everything from there. Uh, we send him, if he needs any literature to draw upon, um, we send it to him by email. Of course, there is this immense difficulty of, um, they don't have regular internet, they don't have regular um, electricity, so they work on generators. Um, in the winter, they didn't have any heating, so basically he was wearing uh, coats and things. And there are many things that as, as researchers we take for granted and um, that are not present in the Alison context. Uh, recently, we have co-authored an article that is called Occupied and Besieged Towards a Rationale for Teaching Arabic as a Foreign Language in Gaza, um, in which Nazmi envisages this program as a way of breaking the siege. He wants to create more employment for the teachers in Gaza. Gaza has an immense, immense level of unemployment, among, particularly among the teachers. He wants people to feel proud of their identity. He wants 
to uh, convey a different image of Gaza than the one that's conveyed in the BBC and Western media. So we are on the other side, we're trying to help him to do that. We have a big um, symposium for the entire project in Brussels next week, and Nazmi will be with us, and he has always been with us via Skype. We have him in all meetings to the extent that when his, when his connection breaks down, we stop the meetings. People have immense respect for the value of him as an academic and of his um, entire research group. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for your presentation and your participation and uh, the quality of both of them. So I think that we will carry on the, the week. So